Hi, I'm Maddie. And I'm Ella. And today we're going to talk to you about the menstrual cycle. So after we did a couple of Instagram posts over the last couple of weeks, we got a really big response from you. So we just put a little video together to explain a little bit more about the menstrual cycle, where the current research sits and what we're currently looking to do for the clients on our premium plans. So I thought it would be useful if we both give a bit of background about us. So I'm a coach. I've been with Lattice since June 2018. In terms of my climbing background, I've mostly been a boulderer and more latterly a sport climber. Sort of bouldered up to AA plus and sport climbed up to AA plus as well. And I've got a big training history. From more of a personal point of view for me, like my background, um, I will continue to be aspiring to boulder AA plus probably for the rest of my life. <laughs> Um, and I have probably a bit less of a training background than Ella, but really came into this role as a coach in Lattice Training from a rock climbing perspective. Um, that's where a lot of my experience lies. I started out in trad climbing and that's, that sort of evolved and started to incorporate sport climbing and red pointing. And at that point, with when I started red pointing, that is when training came into my climbing and became a process I really enjoyed in itself. And yeah, from that, this has expanded into this sort of interest in the topic of female physiology and the effect of the menstrual cycle on our performance. So <laughs> I think one thing we wanted to talk about to start with is our own experiences of our menstrual cycles. And because I think that's a good starting point, we're quite different, I think, aren't we? In yeah. how, how we've approached that. So I was on the oral contraceptive combined pill for around 16 years and I've only recently since September last year come off that. It's a really prolonged period of time being on one form of contraceptive, essentially not having real periods as it were and I've come off it and I've had three full cycles of a natural menstrual cycle now. So I'm just at the beginning of my road of understanding my body under a natural menstrual cycle and I think you're quite different. Yeah so I um, came off my contraceptive much longer ago and so I've now been having a or we say normal like a natural menstrual cycle for quite a while and I feel like I've from a point of view of training and climbing I feel like it's been quite a interesting experience to sort of get in tune with my body and I use some tracking apps to really well to monitor my cycle length but also some of the symptoms I had and I have now stepped away from that and really implemented some adjustments in my training that I feel have really helped from a personal perspective in my sort of experience as well as sort of like my recovery and things like that. So this is quite um, a new area of research and a lot of the research that is out there at the moment it's very much an expanding area which is great and we're really excited about that but it's quite hard to draw at the moment any really solid conclusions from the research. There's quite um, an inconsistency in results. They're quite small group numbers and we know even just from the female clients we work with that there's a really big variation between the sort of symptoms and experiences that females have. And also I think accounting for your training age as well can have a bearing on how that research is, is conducted and your men menstrual age. Yeah, like your sort of gynecological age. Um, there's quite a bit um, of a difference between the research done in young athletes to slightly older athletes. And I think in our view, this is not a reason, this shouldn't be a barrier for undertaking research. And I think you and I feel quite strongly, which is why we're pushing this quite hard internally, is we want to start the ball rolling. And we're also very conscious and we're not ignoring you. We know that there are those of you out there who've already asked us about perimenopause, menopause, postmenopause, and how your hormones change throughout those periods and how you might adapt your training around that too. We are not ignoring you. We have that on our to-do list and we'll get to it as well. Um, yeah, but definitely. for today's purposes, we are just looking at a menstrual cycle for a, an, an individual of reproductive age. So we thought we'd start off with an overview of the menstrual cycle. Those of you who are watching this um, know full well all about the high and the low, low hormone phase and the changes and adaptations in your body. Hopefully this will serve as a useful refresher. For those of you who are fairly new to this, Hopefully this will be great 
introduction for you. Again, I think we both want to be very cautious in saying we are not giving absolute black and white advice no, not a lot at all. of the time. It's it's more around potential things for you to be aware of. It's yeah. your body, your experience will be quite different potentially. Like Maddie and I already discuss it and have different experiences during the month. So it's more about awareness for yourself, but we'll give you some pointers and some ideas along the way. Yeah. So first off, with the menstrual cycle, what do we mean? Well, we essentially normally have a typical 28 to 35 day cycle. Now, mine seems to have varied in the three cycles that I've had around 29 to 31 days. And that sort of fluctuation is probably quite normal. Yeah, so we're not perfect, we're not yeah. robots. <laughs> we will change from month to month and that's to be expected. Again, that shouldn't be a barrier to adapting our training. No, but I guess, a really important point to take away from that is that when we talk about the menstrual cycle, we don't just mean your period. We are really talking about the whole process that goes from day one, which is the first day of bleeding, through to ovulation, through all the way to the next um, first day of your period. And obviously this doesn't apply to those of you who are on the oral contraceptive pill. So I was on the combined pill, so I had a 21 day pill packet and a seven day withdrawal bleed if I, cho if I chose to use it. Other pill types you'll be continuously uh, taking synthetic hormones and you may not have any bleed whatsoever. We are not covering that. When we talk about the menstrual cycle, we're talking about your natural menstrual cycle as if you weren't taking any form of contraception. Yeah. Um, I think the first thing we need to say, it's a bit of a myth bust and I think it's quite out there now isn't it in, yeah. in everyone's minds is that it's important to have a period because that's a sign mm. of your health yeah Both if you are within sort of reproductive age then you really I think there has been for quite a long time this sort of misconception that if you're athletic then it's actually really normal to have a very irregular period or missed periods and yeah, we just sort of want to myth bust that that is not the case. We actually went to the Red S um, event at the weekend um, with a endocrinologist and a dietitian. Yeah, and they were very much sort of hammered home that point. Of course, there could be other underlying medical issues where that is not the case. So we're more talking about a deviation um, from normal for you. So. The low, the low hormone phase, we'll, we'll begin with that. We're going to split it into to two phases. It's, it's a little bit simplistic um, because your hormones are fluctuating quite a lot in that period. But for, just for general purposes, we're going to re reference two phases today. Your low hormone phase or your follicular phase. And your high hormone phase, your oh. luteal phase. Absolutely. So in your low hormone phase, we typically start that at day one, which is the first day of your period. And we imagine it runs for a two, two week length of time, so 14 days. What, what happens during this phase? Well, our, our hormones are fairly, well, when we're talking about hormones, I'm talking about estrogen, testosterone, and progesterone. And there are other hormones in the mix. I, I wouldn't want to ignore those, they are there. Um, but for today's purposes, we're talking about those three. Yeah, and really mainly, I guess, estrogen and, progest estrogen and progesterone are, are sort of main female sex hormones. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and what happens in our low hormone phase? Well, from a, from a performance point of view, that's when our hormones are at their lowest and in theory, we should be able to achieve peak performance, perhaps hit PBs, perhaps train mm -hmm. at a particularly high intensity, looking for, for lots of strength training um, at that, those higher max levels. And potentially improved um, adaptations as well from the strength training during this time. Yeah, yeah. so your rate of perceived exertion, which we use as a, a measure at Lattice, we call it RPE for short, might be quite low. Yeah, and sort of energy levels high. And I guess um, one thing that I will just note, and again, we're different here, is that we are talking about day one of this um, like cycle being the start of the low hormone phase, but also day one of your period. So there is a bit of leeway here in terms of sort of your peak performance, depending on whether you get any sort of cramps along with your period. There might be a few days to wait before you start to feel really ready to like push your training and climbing again. Yeah, and I think this differs because I've experienced fewer symptoms um, in that day one and two, and Maddie's the opposite. Um, and we will come on to talk about some 
um, dietitians and doctors out there who have talked about potential nutrition strategies to try and mitigate that. Um, there's a lot of really helpful information coming out now, mm -hmm. um, particularly on Instagram and through other sources. Um, and we'll make sure that we always try and inform you of those sources as we go so that you can read them yourself and try them out. When we're in the low hormone phase, what happens towards the end of it is that we ultimately ovulate. Yeah. That can be around day 14, it can vary. So ovulation is called by that peak in oestrogen. Yeah, and the consequences of that peak are uh, an increased potential for injury risk. So there are some studies out there that have shown quite an increase in joint laxity. Yeah. Um, there's been quite a bit of research around female footballers. Yeah, and ACL injuries. So again, this is not climbing specific, but we're sort of drawing parallels potentially with females that are a bit more hypermobile. There's also been some research that shows um, some reduced like balance and stability. So this could be quite important for certain climbing styles, especially with the comp styles, you know, cut looses. This might be a time to be a bit more wary of those. Yeah, and I think it would be really interesting to look at smaller joints. So, you know, we've yeah. got studies on the knee. And the ankle. And the ankle, we could do some more on the shoulders and mm -hmm. the fingers. Um, in particular that are climbing specific, so I'd be quite interested in exploring that. Yeah. In terms of other things or the symptoms that you might experience during ovulation, it may not be a symptom, maybe a positive thing, you may yeah. feel high energy um, and you may feel that you can really go for it, um, but I think others have had the opposite kind mm. of feeling, so I think it's really personal yeah. as to how you feel. And I think it's quite interesting there because that spike in oestrogen for some people has very much been linked with um, yeah, a high energy level um, and high motivation and like increased cognitive ability. And then that sort of maybe sort of um, contributes to the increased injury, res injury uh, risk because of course when we feel really good, we maybe push a little bit hard, potentially end up injured. So around this time, it might even just being like a little bit wary of how good you're feeling and stopping strong to reduce that injury risk. So then we have, we've had ovulation, you know, we have a fertile window as um, the experts like to call it. Um, we ovulate and for me, I've noticed that obviously I think it comes with a spike in temperature and then you know you've ovulated and then you're into the second uh, phase of your cycle, so, the high hormone phase. Yeah, so this is the high hormone phase, which if we're looking at a sort of typical cycle length, we could say that it's the second two weeks. And this is where um, both your estrogen and progesterone levels increase to a peak and then they start to drop off before your next period and that time is sort of classed as your PMS week. Your oestrogen in this period is building up the womb lining, your progesterone increases to maintain that and when there's no fertilization or pregnancy then that's shared as your period. Um, and this in general is um, has been shown to be a time of I guess lower peak performance maybe reduced strength gains, but better um, better sort of endurance ability, which could potentially be linked to your increased fat metabolism. You may find that water retention is a bit higher. So I notice my weight goes up a little bit and that also my sort of um, rate of perceived exertion increases mm -hmm. somewhat. It's sort of a bit harder for me um, to access that top end. Yeah, and I think this is again, quite an important point that, so we're talking about your relative perceived um, exertion. And this also could be linked to your increased, you get an increased um, basal body temperature as well as um, like a lower cardio output. So, you know, you might get more out of breath doing those sort of more sustained endurance sessions. And I guess this is where we'll just sort of make it clear that this doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't do these sessions and that you won't make training adaptations from them but actually just being aware of the fact that this is why the session feels a bit harder could help with your motivation throughout the session and potentially an adaptation you could um, do here is to reduce the length of the session. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, Maddie, because we've, we've gone through all of this, what happens during a cycle typically, but you're probably thinking, well, great, what does this mean in practice? And I think it's, it's more about knowing how you feel Mm -hmm. how your body responds and then planning your training and optimizing your climbing around that um, to see to see if that can help you from a performance perspective we're not saying as Maddie rightly points out you shouldn't do a session and we're not saying you shouldn't strength train in the high hormone phase but it's more about recognizing if you need to modify it 
or psychologically, as you, and it's really important, isn't it? Yeah, motivation's a massive, you know, component you of our session, climbing and training. Yeah. And if you go into a session knowing it's going to take a little bit more to warm up, um, or you're going to have to do a few more, let's say, fingerboard max hangs before you can access that top end, mm -hmm. then you great, you know that and you're ready for it. Yeah, or that like, you know, this week your anaerobic capacity feels like it's making you a little bit more out of breath, but next week actually it probably won't be like that and it's the consistency in that training throughout that's ultimately going to give you the progression that you want to see um so yeah i think we've made that point that really this is all about optimization of both climbing training adaptation and experience um so yeah again what does this mean and how would you do this like how would we implement these changes into your plan um so the first really simple adaptation that we could make would just be the timing of your deload week. There might be a certain time in your like premenstrual phase or the start of your period where you just feel a little bit less motivated, a little bit, you might have some cramps, a bit lower energy, and we could simply time your deload week with this so that you can really make the most of the rest of your time. And I think at Lattice, we already do this. Yeah. So we've worked, we've been really privileged to work with some female clients who have been quite open for us to match their deload week either with a few days before mm -hmm. their period or perhaps um, overlapping a little bit before and a little bit after or even during. Um, I've had some uh, an individual who's really struggled during their period mm -hmm. with the symptoms and, and to manage that so we've, we've timed it around that. Um, another option would be more periodizing your strength and endurance training so that you can really make the most of your low hormone phase and sort of then maintain this through your high hormone phase. One thing I've really found as well, um, which is an important point to make when we're talking about like maybe um, training, uh, making training adaptations is that strength say can be trained in a number of different ways. And it might be that during a certain point in your cycle, something that I've quite commonly found is that females report lower coordination and so maybe you move away from sort of training hard bouldering or something and you look to strength train more um, using more conditioning exercises that use them um, like a require a lower degree of coordination. And a so it's simpler movement. And basically. a simpler movement. Yeah. So again, it's more that we can look at how you're performing at that time and tailor the type of strength training session to what's going to best suit your phase at that time.